Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. I am your host, Emmanuel Roche. Thank you very much for listening today. Every other week, I interview chefs, pastry chefs and bartenders to discover their secrets behind the scenes. I want to know what compelled them to become a chef or a bartender. I want to learn everything about their creative process and discover the unknown flavors or ingredients they are experimenting with in their drinks and dishes. Today is episode 18. And as usual, you can find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. Click on the episode page. My guest today is Chef Trig Brown from Winson, Brooklyn, New York. This episode is a story about a passion for Taiwanese food and how to bring it to the Brooklyn consumers. It is a story as well of friendship between the chef Trig Brown and his business partner, Josh Koo. Stay tuned because at the end of this episode, the chef is going to share with us a way how to cook prawns with a Taiwanese flair. Hi, chef. Welcome to the show Flavors Unknown. I'm really excited to have you, um, you know, as a guest today. Thank you for having me. I want to start directly and uh, ask you the question, why compel you to become a chef? I, I started cooking when I was 15 or 16 professionally. I started washing dishes in a restaurant near my home and outside of Richmond, Virginia. And I kind of just kept doing it. And I, you know, I took school very seriously and um, I, I even ran track and I went to college. But the whole time I was working in the restaurant, you know, some weeks I'd you know, have to work a little less than others, but I, I always worked in a restaurant since I was 15. So, you know, that was a serious passion of mine that I had been honing, honing those skills for, for some time by the time I graduated school. So I just stuck with it and had a good opportunity after college to take a management job and had made some good connections with some folks in New York and was able to, to keep learning at a, uh, in a really high quality way. And it just kept me interested and attracted to the the craft of cooking and the environments and kitchens and restaurants. I'm a real ADD person and, you know, I like to work and I, and I have, I feel like I have an artful eye. I, I enjoy, I enjoy that side of it too. But when you said you went for, you went in college, so did you go in college? Is it related to uh, culinary school or it was completely for something completely different? Yeah, no, I actually went to uh, the University of Virginia and studied literature, English literature. Oh, wow. Okay. So not very, so the, the, so cooking and being a chef, you know, uh, is definitely something, you know, after then your, your studies. Yeah. I mean, some, sometimes after, sometimes my studies suffered from, my, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it was always, it, it was always kind of hand in hand, you know, I, cooking was, didn't feel like my studies because I loved it. If we fast forward, you, you open Winson in 2016. And so it is the story of uh, really a friendship. So tell me about the moment you met your future business partner, Josh Koo, and then you both decided to turn your passion for Taiwanese food in, into a business. It really just happened like that. We, uh, we met at a barbecue. His, my neighbor was one of his best friends, Neilan Kalik. He's a large fabric in our relationship. We had a barbecue. Josh came over. We were both busy and working a lot. So we just became friends very casually. I had strange days off if I even had them, you know, when, uh, when they'd sync up with maybe nine to fivers schedule, it was always fun to, to do like a barbecue or, you know, a grill out or, you know, one time we cooked a bunch of soft shell crabs, fried them on the fire escape with a, electric fryers and had a big party around it on Memorial Day. I think like, you know, these were exciting, uh, you know, times for us because, you know, we just weren't, we were, we were grinding at work and, you know, Josh and I really just met over food. At some point along the way, I found out that Josh's parents were from Taiwan and he's Taiwanese American. He took me to this restaurant he, he loved going to growing up among many others. To be honest, we went to a lot of restaurants, but this kind of mom and pop spot out in Flushing, it's really has our heart still. And, uh, the conversation would, would usually at some point, you know, not even the entire time, just at some point, you know, settle over significance and contextualization 
I was learning about what Taiwanese food was or is and w- which dishes on this menu were from Taiwan or, you know, how they got to Taiwan from China or Japan and how, you know, they are kind of almost transliterated here in, in, in American kitchens. And uh, it was just always a fun learning experience. And I think it, it felt, you know, it was stimulating and challenging and in, in, in a really casual way. And, you know, Josh and I were usually uh, eating out and flushing in these rare kind of moments of free time, which neither of us really had. Going out there was kind of like an escapist or some form of escapism from, you know, the, the grind. We eventually start cooking Taiwanese food together, at, you know, at home. Uh, you know, I would go over to his place and we'd have some folks over and cook, cook a few dishes and just see if we could do it. You know, I think we were really kind of happy about it. And Josh was working on a property that, that he was managing and the landlord wasn't getting the right kind of bids. And Josh, you know, kind of saw this opportunity for us to do it ourselves and asked me if I was interested. And he really made, uh, made an opportunity for me to execute a restaurant concept with him. Because he was not at all in the restaurant business, but you were already uh, cooking at restaurants, correct? Right. I was actually at the time where, uh, you know, before Winson, I, was, I opened uh, with Justin Smiley and Steven Starr. I was a sous chef at Upland Restaurant, which is like one of the more hyped restaurants in 2015. And, you know, the Clintons eat there and Obama's eaten there and a lot of famous people. It's you know, a great location, unbelievable food. Justin was a really challenging and in, in the best ways I could ever say, like to work for, you know, he's really hard to work for. And, uh, but you, you know, it was like management boot camp. You know, I, I had not previously been a manager since I was in Virginia. So getting back into management after several years experience in New York and working for that guy, you know, he's, he's a tough, he's tough. So working for him, you get tough, you know, from someone who thought they were tough before working for Justin, I uh, really appreciated that. I always think about lessons I learned there, you know, as any other restaurant, but uh, you know, that was a fun thing to be a part of. Talking about lesson learned. So can you share with us like uh, your, how you, you met your mentor, Pei Chang and, and how he, he changed your life? When I got to Charlottesville from this little town outside of Richmond where I, where I lived to, to go to college, I'd been working in this kind of this like country restaurant that, uh, you know, we served uh, lunch to all the people from the golf course nearby and uh, on the weekends and you know, had a pretty good dinner business. And it, it was a great place to work. It was super fun. You know, we had a strip steak and a tenderloin on the menu and also, a, you know, a fish dish or crab cakes and, you know, a club sandwich, fried oysters, you know. It was just, it was very casual and it wasn't not professional, but when I moved to Charlottesville, I started working at this restaurant called Keswick Estate. And it was at the time an Orient Express hotel. The head chef of the whole operation is this guy, Craig Hartman, who kind of brought fine dining to Charlottesville. He, he went to the CIA with Anthony Bourdain when it was only like a 13 person class. And, you know, he's just an original gangster in the culinary world and really brought this amazing, you know, school of thought and approach to cooking to this, you know, little town, Charlottesville. My direct superior at the, uh, at the clubhouse at this facility uh, was this guy, Pei Chang, and he kind of blew my mind. You know, his knife skills were so tight. He's one of those incredible guys that just leads by examples, leads by example, and right, from the way he cuts vegetables and stores things and labels things to the you know, order guides and kind of accounting systems that he has. And, you know, it, you really learn more than just about food working for pay. The level of professionalism I was exposed to, you know, for the three or four years, or sorry, four or five years, I was working, you know, relatively closely with him. I just kind of started to think about cooking differently. Over the course of my relation, my professional relationship with pay and working for him, by the time I graduated college, he offered me a chef position at the restaurant below him. He was working in this build, this two-story building on the downtown mall in Charlottesville. And his restaurant was upstairs. It's a sushi restaurant. And the restaurant group that owns both restaurants asked Pei to be the executive chef of both. And, and I was basically the chef de cuisine or sous chef of the restaurant below. It was a, it's called Blue Light Grill and Oyster Bar. And Pei basically offered me this management position. I had some creative freedom, but was always you know, looking to pay for guidance, writing menus. And, you know, I was executing what he would tell me to execute. And if I didn't have recipes or he'd come up with an idea or, you know, tell me, teach me, you know, being kind of guided into management like that was extremely valuable. 
I did that for, for a year and, and had a great experience doing it. But I had staged and made some good connections with folks in New York. Pay kind of, you know, really encouraged me. Aside from being exposed to for this professionalism I hadn't encountered before with Pay, you know, I learned all these great lessons from him, but he also just like encouraged me to keep cooking, to go forward with my career in cooking. I think that was, he was the only person in my life who was really telling me to go for it, go for it in the, in the cooking world. And uh, that was amazing because most people, you know, in high school, my chef was like, don't do this. This is, you know, this isn't the kind of job you want to work. And the servers and bartenders at that restaurant said the same thing. And, you know, there's kind of this attitude in the restaurant business. Like, you don't want to do this. This is, this is too, the, the hours are terrible. Like, you know, you can't survive like this. And, you know, Pei was like, you should, you should do this. You can do it. So that was, you know, that was incredible. Aside from these lessons that I hold very dear to me, like, you know, to this day and the way, whether it's from managing, managing people or being organized and meticulous, you know, even the way I describe things on the menu, I really feel like I got, I got exposed to a lot of those like good systems from pay. And he just encouraged me to continue cooking. And I think I, like he was, a, you know, been, been in my life for a while. So that, that meant a lot and was appreciated and, and is appreciated. So. And you're still in contact today, correct? He was yes. with you um, when uh, we came to your, to your restaurant, correct? He was helping you um, cooking. Yeah, it was awesome. That was like the, That's cool. the first time we cooked together in a while. I mean, we've seen each other since obviously I left Charlottesville. We, I, I try to, I try to see pay when I'm down in Virginia, which is tough because, you know, he lives in Charlottesville and I'm in rich, I'm outside of Richmond. So you know, sometimes I, I don't get home that much. So I, I, I got to see my family and my grandma and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it was really fun for us to just like have a whole weekend of hanging out and cooking and, you know, eating and trying restaurants. Let's talk a little bit about Taiwanese cuisine. So of course. Taiwanese cuisine is, <laughs> it's not very well known in the U.S. And, and I'm sure people are always confused with you know thai food so so what do you say to your guests i'm sure that happens you know then they arrive to your restaurant the wind sun and they ask if you have pad thai on the menu so what 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 do you say yeah no it has it has happened actually many times you know we say oh well that's actually you know that's actually thai food is a different thing from thailand to taiwan is this little island on the east coast of china the way we describe taiwanese food usually you know focus on the the many influences that have um, become part of Taiwan's kind of national DNA. We talk about kind of the multi-representational aspects of the cuisine. So, you know, you have uh, folks from Hakka, from the Chinese, the, from the 17th century, Han Chinese from the 17th century that migrated to Taiwan. And the, the Japanese were there for 60 years and instituted a lot of systems that benefited the country, like uh, irrigation systems, and censuses and redistributing land. And, uh, and the, the Japanese weren't as ruthless to the Taiwanese as they were the Koreans. So the effects of Japanese culture on Taiwan weren't so negative. When Chiang Kai-shek's regime came to Taiwan with nationalists from all over China, the multi-representational melting pot was just, you know, was brimming, you know, literally to, you know, I think some millions of people were just now in Taiwan from China. So, you know, and then that, that's not even considering the colonial, like mercantile, you know, Spanish, Dutch and Portuguese influences. And, you know, it, so it's just very historically rich. That's actually how I kind of learn how to cook, to, uh, learned or started to learn how to cook Taiwanese food is through history, history books or little case studies about Taiwan. And, um, I, you know, I feel like, uh, I, I cooked Japanese food for a while for pay at his restaurant. So I felt like I had a, a nice little foothold on Taiwanese food. I was not Japanese food. It's not at all similar, but I think like stylistically there's some interchange, especially, you know, like with the pork chop into boxes on the trains, there's a lot of, uh, kind of dashi used in, in, in Taiwan or, um, like bonito. And there's just like a rich cultural exchange. And I would say it's more much more representational of Chinese cuisine, but the, their like flavor profile and kind of some, in some senses, style and almost a little in the seasoning realm. There, there, there's you know, the Japanese influence is is really present. So it was kind of a cool place to start, and like the history was so educational. Like Josh and I bonded over this dish, Fly's Head. We really loved it at at this restaurant, in Flushing. So why is this like you know why is this Taiwanese or what where does this dish come from? And you know, it's so perfect, like these. Uh, little unctuous bits of pork 
are clearly stir fried and then tossed with these chives and they're kind of seasoned and cooked perfectly and they're so small you could easily overcook them so, and the, you know there's it's sweet but salty and spicy it has fermented black beans in it that are very pungent and, and funky so this is like a skillful dish that's like homey at the same and time what's the name of the dish again it's called fly's head because the little fermented black beans look like fly's heads but you know that dish is like you know some people say it's like szechuan roots so that kind of just tracks uh the the way food can you know go from one place to another and, you know, take on a new identity. So just understanding that. So you, t you talk about the influence, you know, as well from Spanish and Portuguese. So can you uh, give some example in the Taiwanese cuisine, or how it's translated? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, you'll see like coffin bread, which is, I think, like a, a Portuguese influence. You know, it's these little boxes of bread that are uh, have a little, the center taken out and they're filled with a little stew, often with squid and vegetables. It's a great, you know, kind of classic dish. You see a lot of these all, you know, in Hong Kong as well. And, um, you know, the little egg, the egg custard tarts, uh, those are pretty pervasive. But, you know, I would say, you know, of, of course, there's tons of examples of influence, but like, you know, the, it's, it's really interesting to talk about the more recent cultural influence, like the, the U.S. military in Taiwan and the introduction of, of butter and dairy and beef. I mean, not the beef, there was no beef, but, you know, there's, it is a heavy, heavy influence of the U.S. because there was such a presence there for a while. You know, beef noodle soup after World War II really started to take off as this like national dish. And, you know, corn, there were big projects from the U.S. to get, uh, I think like Green Giant specifically was importing a lot of corn, a lot of corn to Taiwan. And uh, there, you know, and you see corn soup and like see a lot of corn in Taiwan in general, you know, butter and uh you know, there was actually, I think, a Russian guy that was using, you know, butter in Taiwan that and uh, start baking these uh, these. I think some something, some combination of, uh, of of those elements created the pineapple cake. There's a great book called uh, The Culinary History of Taipei. Betty Hui Wen Hong. She is an uh, incredible writer and just really has some amazing history lessons to offer about, you know, even indigenous clams and why clams and basil is kind of so prevalent in Taiwan. And it will, we'll talk for a few pages about the different types of soy sauces, which are you know, also really interesting, you know, that like everybody you knows tons of different types of, of olive oils that are so nuanced and everybody's willing to excited to try new olive oils, but you know, soy sauces are very similar, but you don't see a lot of brands of soy sauce in the States or, or awareness about diversity in soy sauce. And, you know, that's something I'm excited about kind of people picking up on, but, it's fascinating and it's kind of talking about foreign influences in Taiwan, whether it's Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, or English. And when I say English, I meant to say American, but you know, or Chinese and, and Japanese, you know, you have all these, this incredible melting pot of, of cultures. You know, wrapping your head around it is just, it's really fun. So, Winsome is in Brooklyn. So, you're talking about, you know, Taiwan in cuisine and then. But you are cooking for the American palate. So how do you maintain, uh, you know, the as this aspect of uh, history and authenticity of certain like the dishes and while as well adding like a twist to adapt, you know, to your um, your customers? Some dishes like the dansa mian we serve is like a, it's a very uh, special Taiwanese dish or, you know, you might find it in Fujian, but not really many other places. It's like a bowl of um, pork and shrimp broth with some noodles, some bean sprouts, a little pork stew with a single shrimp kind of sitting on top. And, it, and in Taiwan, you buy a little teeny bowl of it and you probably eat four or five of them. When Sun, you know, we just sell, we sell a similar, it's a similar setup, but it's in a, uh, it's in a larger bowl and it's um, a little bit larger of a portion. And, you know, that's an example of how we adjusted the dish just to kind of fit an American entree format a little better because that's, you know, sometimes people just want one dish to, you know, take out or eat at the restaurant. We felt like that was an that was an okay change. We we really don't like to make changes, but like you know, we have to be aware of who we're cooking for. And at the end of the day, we started out we set out to be a neighborhood restaurant. You know, we're super fortunate to have people come from all over to eat at Winsun. And you know, the better business has gotten, the more we've been able to kind of strike out. And you know, initially, for another example, the oyster omelet in Taiwan, where we eat it in Tainan, typically at our you know our favorite 
favorite location. It's a lot gooier, you know, kind of wetter. And, you know, you almost, if you were really grossed out by it, you might not, you might start worrying about the egg white and the oyster liquor and the, the kind of gooey gravy that's served with it. You know, you kind of might start to like get grossed out by these things. If, if this is not like a, a textural profile that you're into that, that's not necessarily something that Americans are used to eating every day. At first we kind of cooked the egg a little harder and it wasn't as gooey, but we, uh, you know, now we cook it a lot gooier and, uh, we kind of stick to our version of what we had, you know, and people are cool with that. And I think that, you know, people are willing, you know, as we've gotten our name out there a little bit more, people are willing to, uh, trust us a little bit. That's kind of fun to see, you know, see people do. And another example, it's kind of the same thing we did, the Danza, the, we, we serve an, like an entree version of the, the Luro found, and that is like a braised, Taiwanese braised pork over rice. And we serve it with a little pickled uh, jilan, which is Chinese broccoli and, and like a soy braised egg. That's, you, you typically just wouldn't see it like that in Taiwan. So in, in that, I would say like most of the adjustments we make are, you know, a style, a stylistic update or, you know, not even update, just like, you know, I, I like to, I don't like to say that we're elevating or, you know, making, modernizing Taiwanese food. You know, we, we're really just trying to make it work for our neighborhoods, so you know, and whether that's just dividing things up into small plates and large plates and trying to make those price ranges affordable, but also support our business. Uh, you know, that, that, that's a big factor into it as well. How is your creative process and how, how does it start when you are thinking about the dish? Because there's this reference, you know, from Taiwan and, and then the spin on it. So can you talk a little bit about the process? I feel like my creative process is very intertwined with my learning process and how I come to understand Taiwanese food. And typically that's through a historical approach or an effort to contextualize a dish in Taiwanese history or understand where it comes from and how it found its way to Taiwan. And, and through, through that learning process, it kind of touches, usually touches on uh, flavors that are exciting or stories that are exciting. I feel like as a literature major and somebody who's always liked to read and write and, you know, cook and talk to people, all these things kind of factor into learning about food and the stories behind it. It, it just kind of excites me. And I, I really like to learn that way. You know, even in studying English, I really like to learn about history through the author's lens or, you know, the storyteller. And, and, I, and I, I really like all the stories behind, behind food and it, I just think it's so fun to learn and understand uh, and just like create a better general understanding or access and feel like part of a better general understanding. And, you know, I feel like uh, understanding, learning more about Taiwanese food specifically has just made me feel like I, uh, I, you know, when you learn about a regional history that's small and foreign that you just previously didn't know about when you, when you learn about it and its people and what they've done and you, you just kind of kind of ask yourself, well, how did I not know about that? And uh, wow, like, you know, what about other people that don't know about that? That's so terrible. And you don't want to like, you know, go shove it down anybody's throat, but, but you could definitely, you know, entice them to put it down their own throat. By, by sure. By so that's, that's the first step. And then after that, how's the tweaking works? I think not to be redundant, but just to go back to that fly's head dish that Josh and I would eat a lot at at this restaurant flushing it, it it was i really could understand that dish and how it was cooked just by looking at it and tasting it i'm also a pretty visual person so i think identifying visual clues and smelling and tasting you know that's like a f initial process and kind of feeling out the impression that that those sensory the impression made and the impact made on your sensory register you know kind of feeling that out and and kind of making these identifications and kind of seeing how they relate to my experience or my understanding and then processing that into, you know, my own dish or, you know, because the goal with, with my food at Winson is never to, is never to elevate or modernize. It's really just to, to express kind of this impression that's made on me in a way that's respectful to the original story or the person or the place that I learned it from. There's cookbook I got from a friend and I saw a, uh, steamed stuffed whole chicken and then i also saw this same dish at a cantonese american restaurant in san francisco kind of like an old school spot kind of blended the idea a little bit 
together and did a uh, did a fried a fried version of this uh, steamed bird. I had to think about it for a long time and, you know, kind of forgot about it even for a little bit after I tried it out. I was at a place with it where I, I feel like if I grind it and then pressed it, then I could and, and maybe scored the inside of the breast after you, you have to debone the whole entire chicken without puncturing it. And that's a really fun thing to do for me who I, I enjoy butchering. I, I, it's a fun process. But once it's all deboned, you have to you know stuff it with sticky rice. And and I think if I had scored the inside of the breast a little bit and uh, brined it and maybe pressed it so it was really flat, it would have worked out a little better, been a little bit more even where, where you, when you get to the white meat. For whatever reason, whatever was going on at the time, it kind of just fell to the wayside. And I didn't really address it for a while. But last time I was in Taiwan, I was eating TKK fried chicken. They have a little dish where it's just a fried chicken skin with sticky rice inside. And I, it kind of made me think about the sticky rice stuffed whole fried chicken that I was trying to trying to do. You know, I was like, oh, you know, maybe that would be really, you know, it'd be really cool in, in a, inside of a inside of a quail. You know, it's, so it's a really small version of that original dish. And it doesn't have the big bulky breasts that that kind of doesn't get, uh, you know, when, when you fry it for a while with stuffing on the inside, it just, uh, the breast isn't treated right. I feel like that way. So with a quail where it's a much even, much more even layer of, of uh, game bird meat, it fries much more evenly. The sticky rice is, uh, you can taste it more and you, and you can really, you know, pat, make it fit like a baseball in there. So it's just a big ball of sticky rice with a, with, with like a poultry meat and skin outside. So naturally with something fried and savory and heavy, it's nice to have, you know, when I think something like that, I think of like acid and vegetables and, you know, onions and funky stuff like shrimp powder. And, you know, I, I just kind of try to match that so it doesn't feel so heavy. So at the time of the year that I was thinking about this dish, I was thinking about like spring onions and garlic, ramp leaves and uh, ramp pickled ramp bottoms. And I had some cum, some pickled kumquats. So made like a little salad and after I slice the bird, you know, you can put the put the salad on top and it just tastes really good. So I think like a lot of figuring out the inspiration and kind of making that practical, making sure the price works out. And then, you know, sometimes like with the ch whole chicken, it, it kind of fell to the wayside. I didn't even think about it until almost a year later. And it kind of struck me. I was like, oh, let's try this again. And we did it in a whole new way. And now it's almost on the I, I really love your menu and, and there's two dishes that I'm really fond of. It's your fried eggplants dish. Oh yeah. And your fried chicken sandwich. Right. I appreciate that. <laughs> so can you please describe these, these two dishes and, and the inspiration behind, you know, each of them? Yeah, hundred percent. This, they couldn't be two better examples of kind of the polarized sides of the menu. Like the, uh, I've been cooking fried chicken for a long time I'm from the South. You know, it's a, popular thing in the South. It's, it's, everybody loves fried chicken. I mean, whether, whether you're New York or, or Virginia, it's a, you know, or, or in Taiwan, everybody loves, loves fried chicken. One of the first things we ate in Taiwan, when we, we went to this little street and had oyster omelet and, and some tofu pudding and a, a lot of things. And we went back and we kind of fell asleep because we had jet lag. And then my, my business partner and my, and his cousin and I, we went out. It was exciting. You know, we'd had a little rest. We were, we'd eaten, we were hungry again. And, going out and we were going to experience some nightlife in Tainan, which is a quiet town in the south of Taiwan. And uh, one of the first things we ate was a little cart that sold uh, large format fried chicken or da chi pai. You know, you could like smell it from a block away and it was called triple Q, three Q. You know, it's the, when the five Chinese five spice and cayenne pepper kind of hits the hot, the hot chicken skin, it, it like perfumes, you know, a little bit. And it's just this like, sensory overload and crispy, delicious, you know, chicken. And, and they basically butterfly a breast with the, with kind of the sternum bone in. So you have a little bit of a uh, bone to hold on to. And you can kind of, I, I like to chew on my chicken wing bones. <laughs> Probably sounds gross, but that's like my favorite part about eating wings. And, uh, you know, it's nice after you eat like a big, big piece of fried chicken, you kind of like either, you know, chew on the bone a little bit or throw it out. That's super ubiquitous. There's, you know, fast food chains in Taiwan and tons of carts and street side restaurants and restaurants that have this large format fried chicken. And I was like, you know, that, that would be like, you know, Josh and I had, we had already been talking about doing a fried chicken dish. And I was like, Josh, you know, what kind of bread should we put our chicken sandwich on? We should do really simple and just, uh, you know, and, and put it on this, you know, some, some sort of, uh, you know, 
Taiwanese pastry or uh, some sort of interesting Taiwanese bread. He's like, well, this lady at church sometimes makes uh, makes them after church for us. So it's just fried chicken and a bowl of bao. It was genius because the bowl of bao's are very sweet, soft dough, much similar to a concha. And uh, I think even origi- originally the, they come from concha with a cultural inter-exchange, inter-exchange via Hong Kong and to Taiwan. I, I believe that's a, you know, don't quote me on it, but but I believe that's the tract of the of the bowl of bao. It's a famous pastry that you see all over the place, and you see a lot of it in Taiwan. It just seemed natural to put it on put it on that that sweet bun. You kind of have that chicken and waffles, sweet and savory vibe. We toast it with a little bit of butter on our on our plancha, and it, it's just it's absolutely absolutely delicious. It is a must order on your menu for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much. And we also put a little uh, a little mayonnaise on on top that we you know make a little aioli, blend up a little uh, fermented bean curd and some white soy and it's so fermented bean curd is just like a very savory almost blue cheese funky soft spreadable tofu so it folds into the mayonnaise really nicely and gives it this kind of funk and it almost makes it taste like ham uh, and this i'm weird, getting hungry here yeah so, <laughs> it, it, so we spread that all over the fried chicken and then cover it in scallions and cilantro so it should kind of looks like uh like fast food lettuce, but it's, you know, dark, a nice, a deeper green and it's just herbs. So it's a little finer and that, that really kind of goes well with the chicken also. So, you know, that, that's a really fun dish that kind of mashes together two very Taiwanese items with a little bit of accent, you know, of fresh herbs and the bean curd mayonnaise that, that you know, and, and it's very approachable for Americans. And, you know, while we're not trying to necessarily cater everything towards Americans at the same time we are because we're a neighborhood restaurant. So, you know, or we started out, set out to be a neighborhood restaurant. So we want people to be able to easily identify with the food we're serving and learn from it in a way that wasn't too difficult. So a fried chicken sandwich is perfect for that. We cooked the fried chicken sandwich before we even had the restaurant opened up and other restaurants doing pop-ups. And we've popped up with the Boba guys out in California at their, one of their locations out there. Yeah, that's just kind of like our baby, the big chicken bun. And then you asked also about the eggplant. That's a that's a really fun dish. I actually really like, you know, kind of Taiwanese eggplant, which is usually uh stir fried and uh real in a really sweet soy sauce with basil and garlic and some chilies. A lot of times you can find it cooled down and served as like a shout sai, like a cold uh, appetizer, and it's equally delicious that way. I think originally I wanted to do an eggplant like that. But I really felt like just in the context of the of the small plate section of our menu that we needed a heartier, hot vegetable dish. For whatever reason, um, I thought about frying the eggplant. I, re- I had this uh, black vinegar gastrique I'd made. It's just really, it's acidic and sweet. Kind of use that as an adhesive on top of the fried eggplant to, you know, to catch a lot of cilantro and spice cashews that I put on top of the eggplant. It was just so, so good. But it, it made me think of labno, which is uh, double string Greek yogurt. It's very creamy. It's like a perfect sauce and it really mashes up well with the black vinegar. While Taiwan is no stranger to yogurt, the labna is definitely Mediterranean, Eastern Europe. You know, it's, it's like, a, it's definitely not a Taiwanese ingredient, but that dish is like kind of, it was a stretch. I didn't imagine it would stay on. I just kind of wanted to have it there for as a placeholder while we, you know, fleshed out something else, but it ended up being like one of the best sellers and people just love yeah, that's it. That's a staple. Again, don't take it up. <laughs> yeah, no, I won't. I won't. People love that thing. It, it's funny. You know, I, I always like, it's challenging for me to even talk about the eggplant because it, you know, it was a very stressful time opening the restaurant. And it was one of those kind of like almost accidental dishes that I didn't really intend to be like that. And I, I feel like I was trying to kind of put a, a, a square peg through a circle hole and, it just kind of came out in this way that was that that was really delicious and we kind of just like couldn't turn away from it you're talking about the stress you know around like opening you know the restaurants and yes it could be complex and stressful so what are some of the the tips you know top tips that you can uh, maybe share that, you know with those that uh, maybe are listening and are interested in getting in the in the restaurant business you know i, I don't know i work i worked a lot you know, since I was younger, I think, you know, just having a good attitude and and learning from everybody you can, whether it's a dishwasher, or, you know, sous chef, prep cook, or chef, you know, really look at everybody as a teacher, especially folks that have been in this business for a long time. You can really learn what not to do and what to do. 
I think like getting letting your ego get in the way can really be a problem if you're if you're trying to learn, staying humble. You know, I've just been really lucky and met a lot of great people. I've learned a lot of good systems from like Pay and many others. This is Chef James Tracy, I moved to New York to work for. And when I first came to New York, I worked for free for for a long time. <laughs> you know, I was oh, I was wow. coming up in the summer and I would dedicate a portion of my summer to living on my brother's couch and, you know, just basically watching and cleaning and basically earning a place in the kitchen, you know, and uh, hanging out with the guys. And, I, you know, I realized there's so much going on, you know, eventually I was, you know, making the, making the canapes under the watchful eye of the garmage station and then the chef. But, you know, that was uh, the Muse Bouge. When I got to make the Muse Bouge, I was like so proud and excited to get involved, be a part of their service. It was really an honor. That really set me up to that kind of mindset, you know, you, you don't make a lot of money in the restaurant business or, you know, the margins are tight. You can make a lot of money, but you can sure fire make a lot of money in a lot of other industries with the same amount of work. You know, you really got to love being in the kitchen and you got to love like the environment. And, uh, and I feel like, you know, you got to really understand that like the payment you're getting from working in other kitchens and for other people is the knowledge and the experience. If you can really take that in, you know, you're learning just so, something priceless. And I think that's definitely been a big part of, uh, of my career is just learning from great people and having good examples. And in 2019, it's the award, you know, year. So you, you received the Rising Star Award, you know, from Star Chefs. And then you got like the, to the semi-finalists, the James Beard Award. So. What do these recognitions represent, you know, to you? You know, I don't know. That's a tough question. The, uh, I would say it, it definitely feels good to get recognized. You know, I'm, I'm proud of that and uh, humbled by it. You know, it's, it's uh, strange for me to be recognized like that, though, too, because, you know, the people, usually the people I've worked for are the ones getting these kind of recognitions and awards. So I just feel like if we can, you know, it makes me, it kind of inspires me, you know, if we can keep going then we can, we can keep ma- you know, we can keep making it. Hopefully it's hard to get out of that survival mode in this business. Sometimes something like that is, uh, is just humbling. I hope that, you know, inspires belief in, you know, the people that are working for us and with us that, you know, we can, we can do it if we keep going, you know, a lot of people are focused on the food and restaurants because that's what a restaurant does is serve people food and drink. So we have a really, uh, incredible team in the back of the house and the front of the house. It's so underrated you know, what the, what the, the service at the front of the house provides and the hard work, uh, the guys in the team on the team do, um, in the back. And, you know, my business partner, Josh, he's just an incredible partner. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't do my job without him. I hope we can keep pushing and showing how these other folks on our team provide value. I think that's kind of what that means to me. You know, if, if we're getting recognized in this area, you know, there's just a lot more to show. So hopefully, Hopefully we can keep that coming. We, we don't have like a PR team or a publicist. So the fact that we've gotten, gotten our name out there and been, been recognized at all is just, you know, something we're very appreciative of. Yeah, I hope we can keep it up. <laughs> so you have been uh, obviously experimenting with a lot of, uh, you know, ingredients, obviously with, uh, you know, all those layers of flavors and this influence from Taiwan and mixing with local ingredients and so on. So I'm curious, what is your latest ingredient obsession? My latest ingredient obsession is soybean paste. Sounds uh, not so unique or special, but people in the States, I, I don't think quite understand soy sauce. Soy sauce is as nuanced as olive oil. And, you know, people love new olive oil and special reserves and, you know, talk about the flavor notes. And, and, I, and I love olive oil, too. This isn't like anti-olive oil. This is just, I hope people can, can start looking at soy sauce that way because it's uh, a large portion of the world uses that and, you know, to season their food. You know, understanding more about soy sauce, tasting the different varieties of soy sauce and, you know, kind of understanding what I, what kind of soy sauces I used to like to use, finding out more, more about other soybean products, uh, other fermented soybean products. I, I had this, uh, I had this soybean paste a lot of folks in Taiwan use kind of like oyster sauce. It's really, it's really salty usually, but this one, this one was very salty. It's a little, it's thicker than soy sauce. It is salty, but uh, this was like a lot more balanced, a lot more depth of flavor, and a little sweeter. It actually had the uh, fermented co- uh, the the koji grains and the in the bean paste still, 
And it was just this really deep, delicious paste that, that I'm really excited to work with. Getting my hands on that high quality product was just really fun because, you know, when you're using, uh, you know, cans of oyster sauce from a, a generic brand, it's just not, you know, it's not that attractive. It's not that it's not attractive. It's like using a, a can of Heinz ketchup. But, you know, like in, in, the, in that regard, like I don't really want to use Heinz ketchup in my food. You know, it's not that I have anything against it. It has it, it has its place, but I'm not above ketchup. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say either. However, it, it's fun to get a little deeper than that. Some things are not broken and you, and, and you don't need to fix them. But it is, it is fun to experience nuance and come to understand something better. So I think, I think swimming pace right now is just is something that's on, on my mind. So I would like to pick up your brain for the uh, home cook that are listening to the podcast. So let's, let's take a, a common ingredients like uh, the prawns. And how can uh, a home cook de- give a Taiwanese twist if they prepare you know, prawns at home? Shrimp is like one of my one of my favorite things to one of my favorite things to eat in Taiwan. You can you know it's very common to go prawn fishing, and you can like go and you know get a little get a little rod set up, and you can you know fish fish for prawns, and you can eat what you what you take. And I think it's very translatable to restaurant on the Chesapeake Bay or you know near the beach in you know South Carolina, even where shrimp is you know just readily accessible and delicious and fresh. If you're taking like a head on prawn or something, uh, a lot of people are really into peeling their shrimp. And I totally understand that. In Taiwan, they fry the shrimp with the head and the shell on. If you get the oil really hot, you know, be, you know like 350, not, not anything crazy. You kind of take the shrimp and uh, dredge them in a little sweet potato flour and drop them in the hot oil, maybe on a skewer that's kind of out of the fryer. So you can, you know, turn it and make sure it's evenly frying and get it nice and golden brown and crispy, you know, just with a little salt or some soy sauce and a little chili flake or even a little mayonnaise. It's like very simple, not fancy, delicious way to eat fried shrimp, which is something that everybody can relate to. Everybody likes fried shrimp, I believe, you know, but with the shell on, it's like uh, that when you cook the shell like that, it kind of keeps the meat tender. The shell gets really flavorful and aromatic. A lot of people don't like to peel that meat, that shell off after they fry. But I literally just eat the shell, <laughs> um, which is I do uh, too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. It's a, you know you got to chew it a little bit more, but it's very flavorful and it just has a lot of flavor. And uh, you know it perfumes the you know the oil, so you can't really use it again. But it's it's great. And I think you know especially the head, the fried head. That it's such as a really satisfying, crunchy bite, that, you know, and it's just great. And I, and I love uh, that. That kind of reminds me of being in Taiwan when I eat shrimp like that with the sweet potato flour and crispy shell. It's just delicious. Thank you. So, Chef, we have been talking for, I think, more than 45 minutes in total. So uh, I would like to finish the uh, interview with a series of rapid fire questions, if it's OK with you. Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Where do you have a drink or where do you eat where you are not working at the restaurant? I usually have a drink across the street at this dive bar called Duck Duck. And I usually, if I am going to have a drink there, I'll probably swing by a taco truck on the way home where a few of my friends from Puebla have a, uh, have a taco truck and make really good tacos. They also usually have some tequila with them and having a little <laughs> drink of tequila after a couple tacos after bar, beer at, at the bar across the street. It's a great, great, easy night. You know, have, get off work, have a beer, have a taco, shot of tequila, go to bed. <laughs> you can't <laughs> do have, it all the time. Uh, it could be a dangerous slippery <laughs> stro- slope. Does uh, this uh, taco uh, truck has a, a name? I think they call themselves uh, Speedy Tacos or Tacos Rapido. That's what they call themselves. Okay. Um, okay. I don't think they've operated with a name, but I think at, at certain points they've been forced to say something. They just call themselves Speedy <laughs> Taco. Okay. Taco Rapido. <laughs> okay. So what is your dirty little food secret or something that other might be surprised that you eat? Oh, I mean, I love canned sardines. <laughs> okay. I love it. Yeah, canned sardines and do, are great. Do you do you eat it with a bone inside? Because that's my my special uh, yeah. you know pleasure when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. to, you know, there's always like the 
the the main bone is on the clean side, the sardine. I love it. I love it. I <laughs> absolutely love it. Yeah, I like smaller sardines. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, like thinner, thinner little little guys. I like the King Oscar brand and the olive oil. But yeah, I do. I do eat the bone as well. Yeah, as, if they're a little bigger too. Yeah, I, lo- I love sardines. I, I mean, I think you know, it makes me think about like camping and taking a can of sardines or something. I, I, I yeah, maybe with a little mustard cracker. Yeah, best. What is your go-to meal to cook for someone special? That would just, I think about my wife, my go-to meal to cook for her. You know, I really, uh, we have, we cook a lot together, you know, like to cook a nice piece of fish and we kind of sometimes take turns cooking, you know, if I, one, one night I'll cook it, another night she'll, she will. We just like to get the skin perfectly crispy, like a plank and, you know, without overcooking the, the inside. So I think that's really fun is to, you know, cook, cook, a nice piece of fish for my, my special lady. <laughs> uh, and, and last question, what is, uh, your dream food country destination? Probably it's really hard. I, I, I have this undying love for Taiwan and, uh, my, my wife is, her family's from Korea. That's so close to Japan. I just like that kind of triangular smorgasbord of food and, in, in, in these different you know, context, it's just so delicious. So I think, you know, being in, being in, uh, in between those, those three countries just makes me really happy. And that's definitely my, my, my dream destination. Each one is a couple hours away and no more. I think that's really fantastic. Thank you very much, Chef. I really appreciate uh, the time that you have given me. And uh, thank you for being a, a guest on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for listening today. No worries if you were not able to write down some information that our guest was talking about, because you can find all of those in the episode show note on flavorsunknown.com. And if you are enjoying the show, please leave a review or a rating as it helps other people to find it as well. If you have friends that are foodies, please send this podcast their way, as I am always happy to have more people listening. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. You've just enjoyed another delicious episode of Flavors Unknown. Hungry for more? Hit subscribe. Tell us where you're listening from by leaving a review. And for social media and show notes, head to flavorsunknown.com.